All right. Well, thank you so much for that super kind introduction. And this will not be a talk in engineering, OK? So anybody who got nervous from that intro, I will not be talking about engineering, uh, which is what I'm used to doing. So bear with me. I'm probably an outlier here, right? I don't know if there's anybody else here um, from the engineering discipline. Uh, so, you know, bear with me if I kind of mess up on the other stuff. But, uh, but, but besides being at the Weizmann Institute, I, I had the uh, committee of Vatat Malag. I, I'm not even sure how you say that in English, but it's the, yeah. Uh, well, okay, that's the, they said C-H-E-P-B-C. I'm not even sure what it stands for, but it's the Vatat and Malag. In, in Israel, all the higher education systems are run by the government. And Vatat and Malag is the committee that basically um, is in charge of all the higher education systems in Israel. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, about the committee as I go through this, but I want to say uh, before I begin, uh, again, for me, my day job is being an engineer, but I know there's you know, many people here whose day, day job is actually in this area and really doing more research on, on gender equity. And I just want to say that for me, it's always such an inspiration to see you know, so many strong women who are outspoken and promoting these issues. And of course, you know, we wouldn't be able to do what we do if we didn't have all these other people and, and you know, women and men around us who are promoting this on higher levels and on a more academic level. So um, you know, you're always a, a big inspiration. And I want to uh, thank Shulamit for inviting me here today. And you are truly an inspiration. I've been seeing through our committee a lot of the activities done here at Haifa University. And I, I can only imagine how difficult it is. So uh, you know, yashar koach. Uh, okay, so let me begin. So what I want to do is give you a, a, a bit of history. Uh, you, again, this is history in Israel, what, what is going on in higher education um, institutes, a little bit of the numerical data. You know, I'm sure many of you have seen this. The data is probably very similar in Israel and in other places, but I think, again, coming from the mathematical disciplines, uh, it's always good to have data and to know, you know where the changes that we want to make. We'll then talk a little bit about the work that our committee has been doing uh, to promote gender equity in academia here in Israel. And we'll end by describing a new program that uh, we're kind of very proud of. It's kind of the highlight of our work, uh, the Equator Index. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, going back to a little bit of history, which you know I think is a little bit surprising, actually. So the first time, officially, I'm sure there's been Tons of activity, not officially, but officially, the first time the issue of you know the gender situation in the Israeli academy uh, was brought forth in the Vatat Malag was in 2011. So that's not so long ago, um, and there was a very important committee. Uh, by Professor Rivka Kaumi, so many of you know her. Uh, she has always been very outspoken on gender issues, and she headed a committee, which was the first committee to really just you know study the situation of uh, women in academia in Israel. And this, was, this report was then brought to the Malag, which again is the regulator in Israel for higher education um, systems. And following that report, so the first report was really just you know, pointing out the issues, the challenges, the obstacles. And then another committee is formed. So I think you know that's always what happens, right? There's a committee, and then another committee, and then another committee. But these were all head by by really, really um, uh, powerful women who do a lot to promote these issues. So there was a, sec a second committee by Professor Otarnon, and her committee uh, was already a more practical committee with you know wanting to come up with action items. You know, what could we do um, to change the situation? And the report of Professor uh, Routernon was brought to the Vatat when I was a member of Malag, a member of the, higher, of the Committee for Higher Education. And you know, following the report, we formed this committee for uh, gender fairness saying, OK, you know, there has to be a dedicated committee where we could really do something. Otherwise, there's just going to be a report and another report and another report. So in uh, Routernon's report, uh, Two of the issues that she suggested or, or pointed out, one was the major obstacle of, of women going to postdocs. So in Israel, uh, most faculty, or I would say you know, definitely over 95% of the faculty, do postdocs abroad. And without that, it's very hard to get a position in Israel. And obviously, for, for a woman, that is a huge obstacle. Because in Israel, you know, people are also older. They typically have families earlier. So most women, at the po or a large percentage of women at the postdoc age, have families, have little kids. And going abroad for a, a few years is a big challenge. And that was one of the things that came out of her report, was that you know, when they looked at the data, that, that was really a point 
where we were losing uh, you know, potential faculty members. So one of the things that came out of her report was you know, to think about how we try to overcome that, how maybe we have larger funds for female postdocs, how we could facilitate you know, their move abroad and their move back. So that was one issue that the committee kind of started looking at. And the other was a suggestion of uh, uh, having large funds to promote programs in Israel um, for you know, gender, relating to gender issues. So that gave us um, the mandate to start uh, the committee that we started, which is a committee for uh, gender fairness. I, we could talk about that a lot, about the name, but personally, uh, at least in the situ as the way the situation is today, uh, for me, the word fairness is more important than equality because, you know, if you look at engineering, there's saying let's have 50% women is just, you know, it's, it's not an option right now, right? We don't, we don't have the pool to have 50% women. But what's more important, again, at least in our field, is that if I'm already in the system, I should be treated fairly. Right, that is, is right now much more important than having 50% women, and you're not gonna get to 15% if the few women that are there are not treated fairly. So that's, that is kind of, in a nutshell, uh, why we chose that name. So the committee started as a committee that had the mandate to examine the different programs and to budget them, you know, select programs that we thought were viable and budget them, and also to budget anything having to do with female postdocs abroad. So it was a very specific mandate. And then after working for two years, um, we were able to turn it into a more proactive steering committee that had the mandate to look more deeply at the issues, the challenges, and make recommendations. Uh, and you have to understand, this is a regulator, right? So any recommendations to Vatat Malag, you know, they have to go through the legal system, they have to be voted on, um, and they have to be the same for all institutions. So the committee is, um, there, there's members from different universities and colleges in Israel, and of course representatives of the regulator, of Vatat and Malag. So the first thing we did in the committee is we said, you know, again, as a scientist, we need data. Once we have the data, we could think of, you know, what needs to be done. So I won't bore you with, with many, many data sheets, but we really, you know, spend a lot of time trying to collect data on different issues. I'll just give you some of the highlights, and I'm sure many of these are figures that you've seen because they're probably true worldwide. Um, but this is, of course, based on institutions in Israel. So the first is the very famous uh, scissors curve, right, which shows that what, what we're, oh, sorry, the, the axis here is in Hebrew, so, oh, okay, there's English underneath, good. So it shows, you know, the percentage of women uh, going throughout the different degrees and, of course, into the ranks uh, in academia. And, again, we're all familiar with this, that as you look at higher and higher ranks, the percentage of women uh, is declining dramatically. So if in the institutions in Israel, you know, you start off with 58.2% uh, women, this is not working, but okay. Uh, that which is you know a very large number, right? We're we're a majority. As you go through the ranks, we of course become a minority. And what's even more remarkable, or at least for us, was even more remarkable in these images, is that it hasn't really changed, right? So these different lines over here are different years, and we're looking at a period from 2006 to 2020. Okay, so that's a long time, right? That's 14 years where those are the years where these issues were already talked about. We're not looking at, you know, okay, the old times when people didn't talk about this. So that was a little bit depressing, right? So as even though we're doing so many different things to promote women, still in 2020, we don't really see a difference. Um, this is a table starting to look at, you know, women among senior academic faculty. This is a little bit misleading because it looks high, right? 40% looks high. Um, the, the issue is that here, this includes academic colleges, where a lot of the colleges are colleges of teaching, colleges of education, which are predominantly women. And it also includes all the different ranks. But here already you see that, of course, in universities it's much lower. And then if you start looking at women among associate professors and full professors, even in the institutions that are 100% female, the numbers go down dramatically. And that's already, uh, you know, much more depressing. The other interesting thing that you know, we noted when we were going through these st statistics is that there's institutions that are really 100% female, and then what, who's the president? A man that they brought from the outside, right? That did not grow up in the college. So of course, in the universities in Israel, it's 100% men, right? All the presidents are men. And that we're kind of used to, right? But then you look at these colleges, at least for me, it was shock, because again, I'm coming from engineering, you know, 99% men, I'm used to that. But then you look at these colleges that are all female and they have excellent 
professors, female professors that grew up in the system and they're experts in the system. And then you bring some guy from some other place who's like totally unrelated to the college. So, you know, that was another interesting fact. Okay, another, another fact that we noticed is that in the system in Israel, and it's a little bit different in the US, so in the US you usually have three ranks, right? Assistant, associate, and full. In Israel there's four ranks. So there's lecture, senior lecture, associate, and full. And not all institutions use the lecture rank, but at least in the sciences and engineering, they actually do use it. And what we noticed is that if you look at how the percent of, of people coming in at the different ranks, and, and this is you know, a real issue, 67% are women in the lecture rank, which is the lowest rank, right? So obviously if they start low, then you know, that just slows them down throughout the entire career. Now, you could come in a senior lecture, right? So using the lecture is optional. But what we saw is that it's used much more often for women than for men. And in fact, they were uh, universities, and I won't, I won't go into names, but they were specific, one specific university in particular, where 100% of people coming in as lecture were female. Okay, so they never used it for men, meaning all men coming in were highly qualified and ready to be in senior, and everyone who was not qualified was a woman. So that's already, you know, that obviously um, is a striking number. Um, the other statistics, of course, is if you start looking at senior faculty by fields of study in both universities and colleges, then naturally, of course, you know, the percentage of women is different in different domains. So if you look at the STEM, okay, so these are kind of the STEM areas, then the percentage of women um, is very low. Um, if you look at education and social sciences, then the percentage of women, of course, is is larger, but what's interesting is that even when the percentage of women is large, when you start looking at the rank, okay, so here the blues are the lower ranks, sorry, the blues are the lower ranks, and then, you know, the yellow or orange is full professor, even when it's predominantly female, you know, as you go through the ranks, the numbers go down. So there's fewer women in the STEM, and then even the women that start fewer get promoted. And you could imagine that since there's so few women in the STEM, if a woman was already accepted to a faculty position, she's probably really good, right? So, you know, if anything, you would expect 100% of females going in would make it to full professor because they had to fight harder to get there to begin with. But that's not what we see. We see that even when there's a small number, their percentage gets even lower. Um, okay, I, I think this is the last statistics. There's, of course, many more, but this is important in terms of uh, institutional positions. So again, there's you know fewer women in, in institutional positions, and as you go up, right, as you look at things that are higher on the institutional level, then, of course, there's fewer and fewer women. Okay, so that's some of the data. Of course, there's many more, much more data, but you know, besides the fact that the data is depressing, uh, being more practical about it, there's a few things that we noticed. One is that despite all the efforts, there isn't really a change. Okay, so that's something that you know, we really wanted to think about. And the other, of course, is that the numbers, again, even if we don't expect 50% in STEM, you know, the numbers are, are very, very low, much lower than we would expect. So this is where our committee came in and started to think about what could we do practically um, to change that. So some of the first things we did, which are easier, you know, you have to start with smaller things uh, that will easily pass the regulator. So the first thing is there's many, many scholarships that are given by Vatat Malag for many different purposes. And the first thing we said is that Anything, any scholarship that is run by Vatat Malag, of course we don't control other types of scholarships, but anything that's run by Vatat Malag, at least half of the candidates have to be female. Now that doesn't mean, and by the way, that's another interesting fact which we won't go into, not 50% of the people who get it are female, okay? So that's another interesting fact. But, and that we don't control because there's committees who decide that. But we could control the nominations. And the rule is that the institutions have to submit 50% uh, women. Um, the other thing is that any new programs that are started, or in Israel there's quality assessment of programs, so all the programs in all the universities and colleges are routinely evaluated by the regulator. So the issue of you know, the gender composition uh, has to be a bullet and it has to be addressed. Um, and in appointing professors, so again, we don't control what happens in the university because that's an internal process, but the colleges promote professors through the regulator, and, and there the issue of how many women are among candidates, 
uh, you know, women, how long women have been in different ranks. All of these uh, statistics have to be part of the file when anyone from that institution uh, is, is promoted. So, you know, these are small things, but, you know, it's, it's more creating awareness um, to the issue. Uh, we then started the projects. These are, the attempt here was to have broad projects that are not necessarily about a particular institution, but brought across Israel um, to promote different gender issues. And they were eight projects that were selected, and uh, Shulamit uh, ran a project that I'm sure she could tell much more about. These were really remarkable. And to me, I have to say, sitting at the committee, it was just remarkable to see you know, how much time and effort uh, you know, women in different institutions were really putting into this. So there were eight programs. I'm not going to go um, through all of them. I, of course, want to mention, and Shalomit could talk more about that, the University of Haifa uh, had an excellent program with, again, you know, just, just writing down the project goals uh, to, to recruit more women, uh, to prevent women getting stuck, stuck or dropping out, and to increase, of course, the women's representation in the management levels. Which I, I think they did a remarkable job there. Uh, there was another program that had a lot of impact uh, between Weizmann and Tel Aviv University, where they were looking specifically at women leadership. And this wasn't a specific university program. It was across Israel. So they started these groups uh, for leadership at different levels, where all faculty, all women faculty from all universities in Israel could participate. And a lot of interesting things came out of this as well. And many other programs. So I won't go through all of the details. There were some programs that were more specific, like some colleges had specific uh, programs to help, you know, research workshops and things like that. Some were more broad, um, some were more at the high school level, some were more at the university level. So I won't go through um, all of them, uh, but I will say that they were they were A programs. They were truly inspiring. Green. They some of them are still ongoing and they're still budgeted, um, and that that already at least we felt you know started having an impact. And I think one of the important things these programs all did collectively was raise awareness. Right. Of course, you know, for everyone in academia, but also for us, the women themselves, right? To, to, you know, same like we could work together. We could be a team. If things don't look right, we could, you know, voice it. So I think besides the specific things these different programs did, they really raised uh, a lot of awareness. Okay, we also started with different scholarship programs, uh, of course, specifically targeted at women at different points in their career, including postdocs, so to help uh, women go abroad with families, and we were able to slowly increase that. So now we're up to 30 uh, scholarships, and it's not just the money. So for example, particularly in the postdoc program, the women who get the scholarship, first of all, they have a group, okay? So you know they, all, they know the other uh, women that got the scholarship, and we keep in touch with them, like just how are you doing? Where are you? Did you already submit your file? Are you coming back to Israel? You know, just to kind of push them along the way. So it's also helping them financially, but also um, potentially, you know, giving them that extra push uh, to come back and, and apply. Uh, the final thing, which is already part of the Equator Index, is the advisors to the president for gender equity. So um, this is something that many universities had even before, but the point of the committee was to institutionalize this, um, to first of all force, or maybe not force, suggest, but mandate, maybe that's the better word, mandate all universities to have, and I know sitting here are uh, uh, some of the advisors at, in, different, in the past and in the present uh, in different universities, so they could say more about the actual job. But the important thing from our point of view was to institutionalize it, make sure all universities have an advisor, make sure that she's paid for what she does. And this may seem trivial, but the way the system is in Israel is that you get paid for different extra jobs you do in the university. Um, but things having to do with gender were never paid. And it was a long battle uh, to get it approved that you can get paid for this, like it's a real job, okay? Uh, that you can actually get paid for it. Uh, we went, in, we, we defined more specifically the criteria, the roles, because in some universities they were getting money and basically just making sure that the advisor doesn't do anything. So, you know, we review, the, there's a fixed program. They get a nice budget um, for the program, so the universities have an incentive. And one of the important things that the advisors have to do is fill in the annual gender reports of she figures, it's the European uh, format, which is super, super important, right? Because, you know, it just forces everyone to look at the numbers and also see uh, if they change or if they don't. 
So this is part of the activity. And again, one of the things we saw, you know, we were happy with these different activities. And of course, there's a lot of money involved that we got from the government. But like I said, at the end, when we looked at the numbers, there wasn't a change. And you could argue if there should or shouldn't be a change over four or five years. But being an impatient engineer, to me, you know, five years is a lifetime and there should be a change. And if there's no change in the numbers, then what we're doing is not enough. Um, so this eventually led to what we call the equator index. And the point in this program was to do something that A, mandates all universities to really look at their situation um, and to make a change, right? At the end, we don't want to just say, look, you know, this isn't good. We want the universities themselves or the colleges themselves um, to promote change. So we were thinking a lot about this, you know, how do you encourage uh, management that is busy with so many things to promote change and you know at least in Israel the best way to encourage anyone is to pay them right is to give them money so yeah so um, this was actually the first time in Israel I don't know if it exists in other places but in Israel it was the first time and it was a long battle that we were able to get budget based on gender okay so universities get paid based on the improvement in different criteria regarding gender so that in itself was a, a an important statement and the way the program works is that there's certain criteria that all that the university has to have to even participate in the program for example having an advisor on gender issues and there's some other criteria that they have to meet and then we have a long list of, uh, of uh, components that they have to look at. First of all, they have to report the figures and, and they have to report them yearly so that we could see the numbers. Um, and also they have to, the whole point of the program is to engage the universities themselves, right? Because if we come from the outside and we say, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that, different institutions have different issues. Some institutions are good with A, but not so good in B. And also you, universities and colleges don't like to be told what to do. So our point here was not to say you have to meet this or you have to meet that, but rather you tell us what you think you should do in order to change the situation in your institution. So that was really the idea. Uh, it's, I won't go into it. It's a very, whoever here, I know the, the advisors had to look into it. It's a complicated Excel sheet with different metrics, quantitative measures and qualitative measures that the universities and colleges have to fill out. But the important thing is that they put together their own program, okay? They put together a program saying, you know, we could do in one year this, in two year this, it's a five year program. And then they get budget depending on their own progress, okay? So you're not measured with respect to a different institution, you're measured with respect to your own program. And one of the things we really want to encourage here, and you know, at least in some institutions that, that I was more involved with, we saw it happen, is just the institution itself, the management themselves, having to look at their situation and look at the numbers already made a change, right? Because in a lot of places, I think you know the intentions are not bad, right? It's just that people don't realize there's an issue. They kind of brush it away. But this kind of forced them to look at the numbers, to think about you know, what are the issues, what are the programs we could put out there to improve them, and then you get paid for doing that, right? So um, that was kind of the goal. Um, all universities in Israel participated. We were actually afraid that they would choose not to participate and not to get the budget. But fortunately, all the universities participated. Quite a large uh, number of colleges uh, participated too. There was one university who we didn't approve on the first time because they didn't, anyway, they weren't being sincere, let's just put it that way, but then they reapplied the following year and now we did approve them and there were some additional colleges that joined, so we hope that you know by the end everyone will join, but we do have a high percentage right now that's joining. Another thing that was very interesting is that Following uh, the program, we had a conference to promote young women researchers together with the Israel Academy. And we had a panel of uh, presidents that um, they were mandated to participate if they want to be part of the Equator program. And again, uh, being someone who's coming from STEM and have heard how deans and presidents just refuse to acknowledge that there's an issue, it was, it was really, at least for me, uh, uh, really special to see we had a panel of all, all the presidents uh, of all the universities and some of the colleges, and they were forced to discuss, right, you know, how does the equator index look in their institution? What are their issues? How are they gonna change them? So, you know, that already for us 
uh, was a big step. I'll just end by saying that there was uh, a relatively large budget that the government gave to all of this. And here I have to give a lot of credit to Professor Yafa Zilbashatz, who was the head of the Vatat uh, when we started this. And none of this would have happened without her. So she was a huge promoter. And, uh, and you know, I'm sure we would not have got the budget uh, without her. So thank you very much for listening. I'm super happy to take questions. And I do want to say, I know there's people sitting here who are deeply involved in this from their institutions. And to me, you know, we're on the easier side, right? We just have to put the thoughts together. You guys have to actually do the work. And I really think it's amazing and remarkable to see so many inspiring women who are dedicating their efforts and their time to this. And hopefully, you know, this will help make a change. So thank you. If there's time, I'm happy to take questions.